Extending south to Tuscany, Italy's mountainous western coast on the Gulf of Genoa is called Liguria. A picture book country with paradisiacal cliffs, remote villages, bucket loads of sunshine, and a region known as Cinque Terre. Our journey begins in Genoa, La Superba, the proud as the city is affectionately called, the fifth largest city in Italy. The famous admiral of the fleet, Andrea Doria, had a palazzo built here. And at the harbour, the Commenda de Pre became the Crusaders' hospice of the Order of Jerusalem, which was followed by the Maltese Order of Knights in the 15th century. Both the lower and upper churches are open to the public. Now we are in the center of Porto Antico, the city's once historic trading port. This is the location of the Maritime Museum. There are various plans and ancient images, as well as weaponry, ships, battle scenes and living conditions. Where once stood embarkation piers and warehouses, there are now museums and modern hotels. This, the second largest aquarium in Europe, was built on a mole. Six million liters of water in 39 water pools and tanks. From a terrace, there's a view of the old harbor and a good array of yachts. Renzo Piano was also able to build a biosphere ball here. Vigo helped bring in the crowds, a rotating panoramic lift with good views of both city and harbour. A guided tour of the harbour is a good way to gain an understanding of this city, which became a powerful economic force in the 16th century. The city's new port is the largest in Italy. The 40-metre-high lighthouse is the landmark of the city. Since 1128, it has contained a signal tower for shipping. From the station, the Via Balbi leads to the centre. A boulevard with several palaces, such as the Palazzo Reale, The palace was once the residence of the Savoy Piedmont royal family, with Belletage, gallery and hanging garden. Including a throne room. As the city stretched from the sea to the slopes beyond, it was necessary to build sloping railway tracks and elevators. The Via Garibaldi was originally planned to be a grand boulevard. With the Palazzo Bianco and opposite the Palazzo Rosso of the Brignoli Sale family. Built in the 17th century, it was the last built magnificent building of the area and is considered to be Genoa's most beautiful palace. Baroque ceiling frescoes have been transformed into masterpieces. The Teatro Carlo Felici, the new stock exchange in the Palazzo Ducale, frame the Piazza di Ferrari.
Genoese sailor Christopher Columbus inhabited this small building between 1455 and 1470. His father, Domenico, was guardian of the nearby town gate. The Porta Soprana has survived the ravages of time. The origin of the Doge's palace dates back to 1298, and the Doge's also had a magnificent chapel built here. Genoa Cathedral is consecrated to San Lorenzo. With magnificent arched walls, altars, and the famous John Chapel. Plus church treasures. The seafarer Dalbertis had his residence built on Fortress Hill and spent his last years here. He must surely have looked down contentedly at the gateway to the world. Portofino is one of the most beautiful locations on the Riviera di Levante. Colorful fishing boats and ocean-going yachts anchor side by side in the narrow dock. Fishing here is no longer a main provider of income. Restaurants and boutiques have taken over and tourism flourishes. A steeple dominates the colorful buildings of the small bay. With cafes and restaurants along the pier. Boats in the harbor and a castle on the hill. Below it's like a movie set, and from above there's a picture postcard view of the harbour. A narrow stairway goes uphill, and soon the castle becomes visible. This leads to a small lighthouse, Punta del Capo. Properties on these coastal slopes have been purchased by the wealthy. As holiday homes. Next, the Castello di San Giorgio. In 1557, the Genoese added corner towers and a circular tower to the Fortezza to ensure the strategic importance of this port to their republic. Inside, hardly anything has been preserved. German champagne baron Mumm bought the castle and transformed it into a park villa. The San Giorgio Church contains the relics of the patron saint of fishermen and sailors. As with the castle, it is also situated on a hill. Its facade shines bright yellow and was rebuilt after the Second World War. The adjacent small cemetery clings to the cliff which slopes steeply down towards the sea. Each rock, track and cave was used for burial purposes. This world-famous location radiates a special charm. 
nothing disturbs the idyll of this museum fishing village. In the second half of the 19th century, the European aristocracy, industrialists and the Italian upper class discovered Portofino. In the 1950s, the stars of American films also came here. And when the evening begins and the lights shine out, the scene becomes even more captivating. Further south is Levanto, One of the most popular resorts of the eponymous Riviera shows off its parish church on Saint André in the Old Town Hill. The interior of the early Gothic Colon Basilica has the characteristics of its Genoese models. simple columns and a circular arch and a pulpit carved in marble. Also a white altar with a small pipe organ in the background is a beguiling sight. The silence says it all. Many come here to explore the region, a peaceful area, and now a small town. The Piazza Cavour is at the center, and the Loggia del Comune is reminiscent of the city's medieval history. The museum contains some interesting exhibits. The last remnants of the city wall and its defensive towers are mainly to be found in the southern part of the old town. The church tower can be seen from almost everywhere. Its chimes always on time. The view of the Levanto from its environs indicates the lushness of the vegetation. And here, also situated on the hill, was once the city wall of which much of its defensive tower has been preserved. The small town had to protect itself from the land side as the Saracens attempted to invade it from the mountain slopes. higher, beyond the Sant Andrea church, is the late Gothic San Giorgio Castle. The Genoese built both the castle and tower to defend both city and port. The Genoese were experienced both as a sea power
as well as defenders of their cities. The tranquil rocky bays and long stretches of beach are ideal for swimming and bathing. A scenic gem framed by hills. There's also a railway nearby. It provides a convenient connection to the villages of Cinque Terre. in little time. Monte Rosso al Mare is the first and largest of the five villages that comprise Cinque Terre on the route south. It extends across two bays and two districts separated by a rock. The modern district of Fegina has a long waterfront promenade, a well-kept sandy beach, and a good range of accommodation. A Neptune made of stone finishes the shore on the northwestern side. And the district separating Cristoforo Hill is accessed via a tunnel. There are many beautiful views of the sea. This is the old district, along with a view of the small harbour beach and railway, the lines of which separate the beach from the old town. On the hill, a capuchin monk points to a church. In 1619, this monastery church was built and consecrated to St. Francis of Assisi. Here, the monks found a wonderful place for prayer and contemplation. The view back to the old town shows how the original Monte Rosso is embedded within this hollow. Above the monastery are the ruins of a Genoese fortress from which the surrounding area can be seen. In the centre of the old town, narrow streets lead uphill between colourful buildings, with defensive walls and tower. Despite tourism, the rustic ambience has been well preserved, and the small shops tastefully blend in with the local scenery. The San Giovanni Battista Parish Church is attached behind a loggia. It was built by the Genoese and dedicated to John the Baptist, patron saint of Genoa. The interior was recently rebuilt according to Baroque design. Adjacent, a black and white striped facade catches the eye. The Church of Pirates and the Dead. It is said that pirates financed its construction in order to appease their conscience. In the
In the main square, the Piazza Garibaldi, the local people meet throughout the day and evening. We travel along the coast by train to our next Cinque Terre destination. There's so little space in the station that most of the carriages come to a halt in the tunnel. This is Vernazza, which is considered to be the most beautiful of the five villages, mainly because of its location within a splendid bay. Tourists walk from the station down the narrow main street to the tiny harbour. Harbour the small square is dominated by a large and tight array of restaurant tables. It's a wonderful sight, and the port ends with the Santa Margarita de Antiochia church. Colourful buildings are densely packed together on the slopes, connected with steep and narrow steps. The Santa Margarita Church is connected with St. Margaret, whose finger bones were reportedly washed ashore here, lost and then found again. In her honour, the church and its octagonal bell tower were built. A pier protects the small natural harbour and provides anchorage for privately owned boats. From the pier, steep steps lead up to the top of a huge rock that is covered with buildings. On each side of the village, the banks are rocky and slope steeply into the sea. Vernazza was once only accessible from the water. Today, numerous ships travel along the coast, mainly taking tourists from place to place. The first view from the harbour is a magnificent sight. And from the outermost section that contains a fortress tower, Venazza and its vine-covered hills can be seen in all their glory. From these unique natural rocks, both the hinterland and coast are visible. view sums up the paradisiacal quality of the landscape and captivating charm of Cinque Terre. Just a few steps away from the main tourist routes, peace returns, but most visitors just want the usual urban bustle. And Venazza has both to offer, 
in a fantastic location. We again travel by train whose tracks pass through a long tunnel to our next Cinque Terre destination. Corniglia has no direct access to the sea but extends along a massive rocky plateau about a hundred meters above the sea. On the hilly outskirts is the San Pietro church built in 1334 with an elegant decorated facade and a rose window of Carrara marble. In contrast to the Gothic style of its exterior, the interior is mainly Baroque, but adapted to Genoese design. The villagers are very religious, and so the church is well furnished and in tip-top order. The main altar, with a freestanding Jesus cross and painted dome, forms the center of the three-nave church. The outer side walls indicate that it was built on the remains of an 11th century chapel. San Pietro faces the open sea and adjacent is a beautifully decorated home of a wealthy family. The villagers earn their living from the cultivation of fruit and vegetables, as well as viniculture. In the narrow streets of the old town, the close-packed buildings leave little or no space for a view, only an occasional glimpse above the rooftops. Passing the stone gates of various defensive towers, we arrive at the village's small main square, which contains several parasol-covered tables. This is the Santa Catarina Chapel, a plain and simple building. Here too, the buildings are densely packed together, several floors high, and painted in bright colors. From a distance, Coniglia seems to hover above the sea, as it looks down amicably at the other villages of Cinque Terre. Down below, the train station. 
Again, we travel by train to our next coastal destination. Through another tunnel, and we duly arrive. From here, there's a view of the first buildings located on a rock. The beauty of Manarola is not obvious at first glance. From the station, a narrow street leads down towards the village. There are fishing boats and various elevated buildings crop the view on each side. The rear view reveals a church tower and wine slopes. Fishermen continue to earn their living here, and there are holiday apartments as well as many souvenir shops that satisfy the demands of the many tourists who visit. The upper section of the village contains a fine terrace that offers splendid views, as well as the San Lorenzo Church. Opposite, there's a square and a freestanding bell tower that attracts visitors to the church. Its interior is adorned with a number of works that date back to the 15th century. Side altars with saints. Large oil paintings. And a winged altar with images of saints. Here it can become pretty crowded with sightseers from each corner of the world. Higher up, it's more peaceful and Manarola's buildings look like piled up bricks that reach down towards the sea. The village looks like a cubist painting, and it's not surprising that it has the nickname of the Painter's Village of Cinque Terre. There's also a fine view of both the village and seashore from the cemetery above the small harbour. There's a labyrinth of winding steps. One wrong turn and it's necessary to go back to the starting point and try again. Below, the sea and above, vineyards. And in between, densely packed slopes and a feeling of communal living. What today is a picturesque village was once a community struggling to survive with a degree of independence. The steps, terraces and mule tracks are now popular tourist destinations far removed from their original purpose. Now, our next stop. 
The train transports us punctually to the fifth of the Cinque Terre villages. The station is also very well adapted to the local environment and is squeezed in between two tunnels. We've arrived at Rio Maggiore. A mighty ledge separates the station from the village. A tunnel leads to the oldest village of Cinque Terre. And watchtowers still bear witness to its checkered past. According to legend, it was founded in the 8th century by Greeks who escaped to Italy from persecution by Byzantine Emperor Leo III. There is also written evidence that this location once belonged to the powerful House of Fieschi, from which Pope Innocent IV came. Just beyond the small castello on the hill is the Cappella di San Rocco, which was founded in 1480 and contains only one room. From here, the Genoese founders had a total overview of the village, its environs, the harbour and the sea. The church of San Giovanni Battista was built in 1350. Three corridors separated by columns led past the pulpit, which was created in 1530. And in front of the Baroque main altar is a wooden crucifix. flanked by artistic side altars. Here, a brook separated the town in two halves, and a steeply rising main street was created. Starting at the church, a labyrinth of narrow streets and stone steps crisscross over two slopes. This network of archways and steps travels across signs of faith and the main street. It's lined with interesting shops, cafes and restaurants. From above, there's a colourful tangle of unusually elevated and densely packed buildings. Floor after floor, piled up to make practical and efficient use of every spare metre of the valley. Rio Maggiore was once only accessible from the sea or by pathway through the local landscape. The Via Colombo leads from the mountainside to the small harbour bay. The colourful buildings were almost glued to the cliffs right up to the seashore. The remaining space leaves no room for boats. From here, the final, last leg of our rail journey. There are fewer tunnels, 
and an increasing number of residential buildings accompany the route as we approach a city. We reach a coastal terminal along with hordes of holidaymakers. La Spezia is both a naval and commercial city, the second largest in Liguria. At first glance, rather sober and unattractive. We visit the Maria della Neva church, close to the Piazza Garibaldi. The interior contains marble columns, arched galleries and neo-Byzantine wall and ceiling paintings. It also features the sacred image of the woman from the snow painted on wood. On the opposite side of the Via del Prione, a stairway leads up Castle Hill to the Castello di San Giorgio. and there's a modern funicular railway. The view across the rooftops to the opposite hills of the bay is quite breathtaking. In the middle of the 13th century, Niccolò de Fieschi ordered the construction of the castello. However, in 1273, the castle was destroyed by troops of the Republic of Genoa and was subsequently rebuilt. A bastion against Pisa was created, and the huge bay of the natural harbour was provided with good defence. Today the completely restored Castello contains the city's famous archaeological finds. Predominantly Roman sculptures, cinerariums, objects and mosaics, each having originated from Luni. The Lunigiana steles are the most well-known exhibits discovered in the Magra riverbed. city, a spacious pedestrian area leads to a park which is created between city and port. The cityscape was created according to 19th and 20th century design. Part of the harbour is reserved for fishermen and private yachts. And by way of a drawbridge, we reach a new area that was built on a small island. In the 19th century, the city reached its economic zenith due to the construction of a naval arsenal. Today, the Museo Tecnico Navale is located here. The cathedral dates from the 13th century, was later rebuilt, destroyed during the Second World War, and rebuilt once again. The bus ride from La Spezia to the extreme southern point of the Gulf of La Spezia is well worth the experience. It 
travels alongside the endless warehouses of the military and industrial harbour and through the city's suburbs. The road follows the natural coastal landscape up and down with bends. Fewer and fewer buildings line the roadside as nature takes over. Then it's downhill with more and more residential properties. Next, the magical Gulf of La Spezia. Porto Veneri is situated on a long promontory in a remarkable location on the Ligurian coast. Just outside the famous old town are some splendid exclusive apartments, each with their own character. It was here that Romans founded Veneris Portus, the Port of Venus. The exposed location proved to be ideal in order to control the maritime trade in the Gulf of La Spezia. The city gate is flanked by a tower and opens the way to Via Capalini, which, lined with Gothic buildings, leads up to the San Pietro Church. The church is situated just below the castle, and the main portal of its Gothic facade is decorated by a relief of the titular saint. The 12th century Romanesque columned basilica has sturdy stone walls and a wooden roof. The niches of the altars are white. The miraculous image of the Mother of God, the white altar and the pillars are a fine sight. The architecture was based upon principles of defence and the castle was its crowning achievement. Multiple heavy guarded entrance towers within the mighty castle walls helped to make it seemingly impregnable. It was only by overcoming them that the first plateaus of the castle within sight of the port entrance could have been reached. And the steep crenellated walls on the side made it even more impregnable. And yet Pisa managed to destroy the castle. It was subsequently rebuilt as a modern fortress. The Venus, and below the castle rock, the favorite bay of English author Lord Byron, are to be found along the route to the San Pietro church. The church is located on a rock and boasts a striking facade in black and white. In 1256, the interior of the church was built in Genoese Gothic style with black and white marble. Ex 
excavation revealed traces of a much older pre-Christian place of worship. San Pietro defies sun, storm and rain. The magic of Liguria is based on the contrast between a narrow Mediterranean coastal strip and steep, barren mountains. Whether you walk this scenic landscape or explore it by train or ship, Liguria is a special dream of romance and beauty.